During this dark chapter of history, there are ways to support the Palestinian people. If you want to support financially, the Palestinian American Medical Association has set up an emergency fundraiser to provide medical supply relief to Gaza's hospitals. If you live in the United States and want to advocate for ceasefire, Jewish Voice for Peace has provided a script with instructions on how to contact your representative. And now, on to the video. This region is one of the many river valleys which make up the Fertile Crescent, adjacent to the Mesopotamian River Valley, once considered the cradle of civilization. These lands were, and are, just as important to those who call this place home. Many religions born from these lands revere the waters. Their stories weave along the river bends and sometimes even on top of lakes. In Arabic, it's known as the Gore. In English, it's known as the Jordan River Valley. This region is a byproduct of tectonic systems and volcanic activity, laying out the geography to establish a water system stretching out over 180 miles in length. This region has a unique natural history as well as a complicated relationship with the different groups of people who have called this place as commonly seen in the human relationship with nature, expansionist ideals motivated critical decisions aimed at making the land better. Unfortunately, the outcomes more often than not weren't exceptional. However, there are also glimmers of hope found in modern attempts to rehabilitate the land. We're going to capture both of these through a tour of geology, policy, and some of the aquatic creatures who call this place home. Hello and welcome to Ren Aquatics. I'm Matt, and today we're talking about the Jordan River Valley. To better understand the water of the Jordan River Valley, we'll first look at the earth of the Jordan River Valley. Its geologic features and subsequent geology is a byproduct of the Dead Sea Transform. This system of transform plates comes from the tectonic activity of three different plates. The Anatolia Plate, the Ar Africa Plate, and the Arabia Plate. The Arabia Plate is colliding with the Anatolia Plate while trying to move north. At the same time, the Africa and Arabia Plates are rubbing against each other, creating this tectonic friction. This leads to two different phenomena. The first is a convergent plate boundary between Anatolia and Arabia. What is known as a subduction zone, the Arabia Plate is being pushed downward or subducting at the point of collision. The Anatolia Plate, on the other hand, gets pushed upward. One side becomes magma, the other becomes mountains. These mountains that we're interested in are known as the Golan Heights. Some mountaineering buffs may know its highest peak, Mount Hernan, sitting at over 8,000 feet above sea level. Not just mountains, however. The Golan Heights is a site of volcanic activity. Sometimes the magma produced in the subduction zone will rise up, leading to its own geologic creations with dried lava flows. The second tectonic phenomena is a transform boundary running along the west and east sides of the Arabia and Africa plates, respectively. Even if at millimeters a year, the sheer mass of tectonic plates means that every movement is a massive release of energy. And tectonic plates don't have smooth edges. They're jagged and uneven, each edge containing a potential collision point. These various collisions deform the landscape over time and create novel geological features. Wadis, or valleys, form and they lay out the groundwork for streams and rivers to establish. The sum of these parts created a geography capable of supporting a river valley. Underground aquifers exist throughout the region, but the northern mountains of Golan Heights play an important role in supplying new freshwater via snowmelt. The flow of water from thousands of feet in the sky to below sea level, it leaves grooves in the stone which deepen over millions of years. Guided by the geography of the transform boundary, these waterways turned into what's now known as the River Jordan. It connects the major lakes of the river valley to create a complex water system and has a shared history between the different countries as a natural border, each of them finding life-sustaining waters in this river valley. But what about the fish? In the waters themselves, you could find schools of Jordan bream, creating a breathtaking sheen off of their small bodies. Strap on a snorkel, peek at the bottom, and you may find a Mesopotamian barb, dredging for food along the river floor. But before we get too captivated staring at fish, let's get back at our journey. North of the Jordan River, we start with our first body of water, Lake Hula of the Hule Valley. 
This is when the volcanoes come back to the discussion. Remember those hardened lava flows? Well, some of them created these natural barriers south of the mountain range. This allowed snowmelt to accumulate between these two points in a basin of sorts. Well, one of these basins became Lake Hula, which, historically, measured at 5 square miles. Larger than that, however, was the swampland north of it, measuring at over 18 square miles. Dozens of migratory bird species measuring in the tens of thousands would stop in the hule along their respective paths. What about the fish? Well, it's time to talk about the draining of the hule valley. During Israel's expansionism of the 20th century, there were attempts to impose the western notion of growth to land, and agricultural expansion was an important motivation in this cause. The Jewish National Fund, a nonprofit created to aid in the establishment of Israeli settlements, viewed the swamps as impediments. Not just impractical for agricultural use, swamps served as breeding grounds for mosquitoes, vectors for potentially deadly illnesses such as malaria. And in the 1950s, with a vaccine still 36 years away, disease management through habitat destruction was very much in the public health arsenal. However, both of these points were suspect, even at the time. First, we have a conflict of ideas over agricultural productivity. Though not a traditional agricultural crop, a different iconic plant grew in these swamps, papyrus. This plant was historically harvested as an important textile and a writing paper. Though not a cash crop, people native to the region could harvest the abundant reeds, allowing the habit to flourish with biodiversity. Even if you think that papyrus is as useless as a plant as it is a font, farmers for and against expansionism questioned how much viable land could actually come from the valley. Drained swamps leave behind carpets of peat, a carbon-rich material made of decayed organic matter, being several feet deep in places. This highly acidic ground is not conducive to most farming practices, and requires considerable fertilization and terraforming to be considered arable. For the farmers, that meant a long road ahead. So the farming argument is suspect, but what about malaria? Wasn't this still in the name of public health? Draining every swamp in a region would destroy a significant portion of mosquito breeding ground, but it doesn't get everything. People will still leave puddles of water in tires or turn off a fountain just to let it sit stagnant. Even with flooding, there are spontaneous bodies of water to form where there was once dirt, and all of these can serve as breeding sites for disease-carrying mosquitoes, but none of those are addressed with destroying swampland. So what was the last piece to the malaria puzzle? Well, the piece was education, as was seen with Israel's neighbor, Palestine. Led by Dr. Israel Jacob Kliegler, starting in the 1920s, a joint program of breeding site destruction and public education immediately yielded results in a region where malaria was its dominant illness. Even stated by Dr. Kliegler, the education of the inhabitants was by no means the least important element which conditioned the success of the work. Without active cooperation on the part of the people, this work would only have been partially successful. It was possible to obtain their active cooperation only after they understood fully the significance and value of the work. Lake Hula fits under the drainage approach as a mosquito breeding ground, but to focus only on one insect discredits the hundreds of other species which may call the region home. Swamps foster unique, rich biodiversity, serving as habitat for aquatic, subaquatic, terrestrial, and avian life forms. And remember that the Hula Valley supports numerous migratory paths there were international implications of biodiversity, if you considered the full implications of the system. Environmental conservationists and expansionists alike were in question of how much could be gained, and more worried about how much would be lost. Regardless, the project went ahead in 1951, and in a matter of seven years, Lake Hula was completely drained, drying out most of the swampland. This was achieved by widening areas of the River Jordan, the lake's main source of water, as well as adding additional tributaries in the south to increase its outflow. The consequences were swift, with habitat destroyed at scale. It effectively culled most aquatic life, with fish species like the hula bream and Tristamella intermedia becoming extinct. The Galilean stone loach's population in Lake Hula was eradicated, now only inhabiting waters in Syria. Multiple aquatic plant species were lost from the receding waters, 
And for migratory bird species, the resources available for those journeying were dangerously reduced. The loss to biodiversity is unimaginable. The farmers' concerns about the arability of peat bogs were validated, but there was an extra surprise for anyone trying to inhabit the drying swamp. Remember that peat is carbon-rich, the precursor to coal. It's a material rich in potential energy that just needs the right spark to ignite. When peat is submerged, there really aren't many opportunities for that catastrophic ignition to occur. However, Israel just dried up 18 square miles of this material. Settlements in the Hule Valley would find themselves engulfed in dark, billowing clouds of smoke from frequent peat fires smoldering across the land. Now, a peat fire differs from forest and brush fires because of where each fire gets its fuel from. The majority of a tree or a bush exists above ground, which means that firefighters have access to the majority of its potential fuel. Peat, on the other hand, has some unique traits. First, most people's definitions of dry are vastly different from a peat bog's definition of dry. Even at 50% saturation, peat has been observed to ignite, which means it can smolder particularly well, even after firefighting efforts. Additionally, peat can burn at subterranean levels due to how deep the carbon-rich material can go. This means even if a peat bog fire is visibly extinguished, there can be underground sources of combustion sitting dormant for days at a time until eventually resurfacing. In modern media, you can look at Siberia's peat fires, which birthed the term zombie fires, something truly unreal, yet very much a force to be reckoned with. Before and during the draining, there were voices in protest for the sake of conservation. In the aftermath, the subsequent word voiced for was restoration. Advocacy from conservationists and scientists led to the creation of the Hula Nature Reserve in 1963, a mere five years after the completion of the drainage project. Though a paltry fraction of the original lake, the reserve still is a place of refuge for thousands of cranes and other migratory birds. Even in the shadow of species no more, there is a note of hope in this valley's tale. The Hula painted frog native to the lake had been considered extinct for decades. However, in 2011, this amphibian was rediscovered in a two-kilometer stretch of wetland in the valley. Though still critically endangered, the species' resilience shows why the preservation and restoration of habitat can have meaningful impacts. Floating down the River Jordan, our next stop is a lake by many names. To some, it's Lake Tiberias. To others, it's the Sea of Galilee. For us, we will use the name derived from the Hebrew description of the lake's shape, like a harp, a kinnor, the kinneret. While Lake Hula comes from volcanic activity in the subduction zone up north, the Kinneret is a byproduct of the Dead Sea transforms various fault lines. Sometimes a segment of a fault line may deform under intense force, breaking apart and appearing as if the line slips into a new position. That's a slip fault. Sometimes all those areas of the fault slip, a small basin can form along the slip line. When a pull apart basin is given a source of water, it becomes a lake. For the Kinneret, it has the River Jordan. And what type of fish might you find at Lake Kinneret? Well, you might find St. Peter's fish, uh, the native Kinneret bream, and to those in the marine hobby, uh, damselfish and comb tooth blennies. As a freshwater lake in a semi arid climate, the Kinneret is an important water resource in the region. It has also, unfortunately, been a source of conflict. The various wars fought in this region were complex byproducts of international dealings, cultural divides, and economic tensions. One of those economic tensions was access to the Jordan River Valley as a freshwater resource. Lake Kinneret is one of the most critical water resources in the region, but nations have attempted to place stakes up and down the river valley. Since 1947, control of the Kinneret has been under Israeli territory, under the UN's partition plan for Palestine. This naturally led to discontent from other Arab nations whose countries were already known to experience water scarcity. Israel leveraged the sea with the National Water Carrier of Israel, a public works project that placed a series of pipelines along the length of the Israel state, pumping fresh water from the Sea of Galilee to the rest of the country. Arab nations started to look elsewhere, and they may have recalled how the Sea of Galilee is one segment of a water system. At the very least, that was the base 
basis for the headwater diversion plan of the Jordan River. Instead of monopolizing the lake itself, the plan aimed at reclaiming tributaries up north where all the snowmelt was coming from. Success was mixed, but what it did precipitate was the war over water, a three-year conflict that comprised the greater Arab-Israeli conflict of the 20th century. With a lot of focus on who controls water, one thing left behind was how much water was left. The Israel Water Authority defined thresholds for the Kinneret with red and black lines. The red line indicated a need to pull back on consumption. The black line meant an emergency, as the lake was now at risk of irreversible environmental damage. Since the 20th century, water levels have been steadily declining, reaching dangerous levels in 2002. And yes, it did cross the black line. The 21st century saw a complete rework to how the state of Israel approached water management. Modern desalination technology allowed them access to the far more plentiful salt water of the Mediterranean Sea. This didn't just go into people's homes, but also to the Kinneret, supplementing the lake through novel means. They also embraced waste not want not with wastewater treatment facilities, allowing each gallon of water to go that much further. If not for the intensive cost of energy and capital, the technologies leveraged here have potential to address the ever-growing water crisis around the globe. Climate change continues to be an increasing stressor on all environmental systems, but at least for the time being, the Kinneret can feel some relief. Our next stop along the River Jordan brings us to the lowest elevation on the planet. The river's runoff collects in another pull-apart basin surrounded by large deposits of rock salt. Unlike the Kinneret or Lake Hula, this body has some of the highest salinity on the planet, only surpassed by five other salt lakes. That's right, we're talking about the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, as the name suggests, doesn't support aquatic life. For fish keepers, its specific gravity sits at around 1.3, in comparison to the 1.02 to 1.035 of the ocean. For everyone else, its salinity is at 33.7%. Compare that to the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans that sit at around 3.5%. There are countless photos of swimmers seemingly defying nature by floating on the surface with little effort. However, these buoyant waters can turn deadly if ingested. We know drinking ocean water is extremely dangerous and potentially fatal, but what about water with concentrations 10 times that amount? Dead sea water poisoning is a known phenomenon, as even a few gulps of the water can put someone in significant danger. In a 1988 study of four dozen adults admitted for dead sea poisoning, there was almost a 1 in 5 mortality rate. The severe dehydration of the body, paired with a toxic level of salts and minerals, can lead to seizures, coma, organ failure, and in the worst instance, death. However, hyperdehydration isn't the only symptom, as the Dead Sea contains high concentrations of bromide salt. The historical sedative was removed from most medicines in the 1970s as psychiatric hospitals were finding patients stricken with bromism, or bromide poisoning. Weakness in the body, emotional agitation, and even seizures and hallucinations could occur within these patients. 2% of psychiatric emissions could be traced back to this salt. Though cleared from medicine, bromism has infiltrated its way into the world of wellness using the Dead Sea as its entry point. The mineral-rich waters of the Dead Sea is considered rejuvenating to the skin, providing much-needed minerals. Products infused with the Dead Sea salts claim to be a surefire avenue to healthier skin. Whether or not that's true is not for us to decide. However, it's important to remember that all of these products exist for external use. In the late aughts, a middle-aged man purchased Dead Sea Salt online. This wasn't for an exfoliating bath, however. He was looking to add a more natural supplement to his diet. This sizable supplement was three to four tablespoons of Dead Sea Salt a day for several months. The sodium alone is a fast track to hypertension, but this was also a salt rich in bromides. Feeling general malaise and agitation, the man went to a hospital. Doctors were confused, so they ran lab work. The lab work detected a hypochloremia in the man, which is an imbalance of electrolytes in the blood. Further tests and probing questions into the patient's diet narrowed it down to bromide poisoning. Thankfully, bromide is treatable with heavy hydration and, well... In five days, the patient was discharged in much better condition and prescribed to not consume Dead Sea Salt. The Dead Sea seems like a literal salting of the earth for how hostile its waters are to life. However, in 2011, divers on a research trip found something you would never expect in the Dead Sea. Fresh water, or 
at the very least freshwater sources. In what was probably a difficult exercise in exceptional buoyancy, the scuba divers managed to submerge themselves to the floor of the Dead Sea. There, multiple freshwater springs created brackish microbiomes better suited for sustaining life at lower salinities. Usually you see these environments at, say, river deltas, where freshwater is being spat out into the sea. Biofilms of unique bacteria formed around these springs, either photosynthesizing or consuming nutrients that were being pumped through the water flow. Unlike other extreme saltwater environments, the Dead Sea has developed its own niche for a biome all in its own. Another act of nature proving that, well, life, um, finds a way. We've traveled from the Golan Heights, thousands of feet above sea level, to the lowest elevation on the planet. Along the way, we explored different waters, the unique life they support, and the interwoven histories the human inhabitants have written in these sands. However, there's one last destination on our journey, about 20 miles west of the Dead Sea. This brings us to the West Bank. Even when plagued by decades of violence, occupation, and oppression, Palestine has undertaken a project to restore some of its heavily impacted nature ways. In cooperation with the United Nations Development Program, Palestine started a decade-long project of habitat restoration. The Wadi Gaza, a valley that runs through the width of the Gaza Strip, was a historically vibrant wetland. One of its lifelong residents, Abu Salman, had this to say of the land as a child back in the 1960s. There were a lot of animals, a lot of plants. The water was so clean, we used to drink it. However, water diversion projects from the Israel Water Authority, as well as Jordan to some extent, have decreased inflow considerably. Combined with poor municipal waste management, this once beautiful wetlands turned desolate. Similar to the approach at the Sea of Galilee, Wadi Gaza was supplemented with water from a new wastewater treatment plant. Additionally, over 50,000 tons of waste, which ran along the waterways in piles, were collected and disposed of at proper dump sites. Even at the project's onset, residents are seeing cleaner air, clearer water, and a return of wildlife. Speaking of Wadi Gaza now, Salman had this to say. Now that the valley is cleaner, it feels wider. There's more space for us. At least now, we can breathe a little. That last quote was published in an article in April of this year. More than half a year later, and we are witnessing a war of genocide on these same lands. We hope to show that though war has been a common theme in the late 20th and current 21st centuries in the Jordan River Valley, there are other stories. Stories told over millions of years by geological phenomena. Stories told through migratory birds and resilient amphibians. Stories told through individuals like Mr. Salman, who has friends, family, and communities who all call this place home. A home currently besieged by airstrikes, with almost no land considered off-limits when it comes to military operation. The only guarantee of war is destruction and death at scale. We must have a ceasefire. For the people of Palestine, for all people of the Jordan River Valley. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, links to the Palestine Emergency Medical Aid Fund, as well as instructions to contact United States representatives are linked below. If you like academic papers, links to articles used in this research are also in the description. If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing and liking this video, maybe even share it in a group chat. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you learned something new, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye y'all.